Well, good morning, Cross Point. We're so glad you're here. Why don't you stand with us as we worship our King? It wasn't for nothing that you shed your blood. So I'm gonna live like my shame is gone. I won't be shackled to the way I was. Oh, I'm gonna live like my chains are gone. Cross Point, it is so great to see you all here this morning. Uh, if this is your first time joining us, I just want to say a special welcome to you. If you would do us a huge favor, stop out at the Welcome Center as you leave here this morning. Folks there would love to meet you. They have a gift. It's just our way of saying thanks for joining us today. If this is your first time joining us online, again, welcome. We're so glad you joined us. And if you would, just click that New Here button on your screen. And again, we'd just love to, to meet you and say hello this morning. Look, I know that it's kind of crazy right now, a lot going on with COVID and elections and, and personal things, all kind of stuff that's going on. But Jesus says that we are to, in the middle of trials and tribulations, that we are to take heart because he has overcome the world. And this morning, we are worshiping a risen and living Savior who has overcome the world. So let's continue to lift our voices as we praise him this morning.
the silence break name of Jesus the heavens cry and the earth respond and no creation shouts the voice of triumph to declare the
control Consume me from the inside out well, Let justice and grace become my
seat. In the early, early 1870s, Horatio Spafford lost his four-year-old son. And then in, in 1871, uh, the Chicago fires broke out and destroyed much of the property that he had invested in. And then in 1873, there was a financial crisis, crisis and uh, he had lost almost everything. And, and he'd already been planning to, to take his family to England to start doing some evangelical work with D.L. Moody. And some zoning issues came up with the city as they were still trying to work through the damage from the fire. So he, he sent his wife and four daughters ahead and said he would catch up with them later. Um, on their crossing of the Atlantic, their ship struck another vessel and went down. And, and he received a telegram from his wife that said, saved alone. And so eventually he, he makes his way to England. And, and as, that, as his ship passes over the area where he had just lost his four daughters, he penned the words, it is well with my soul. And I'm reminded as we come to this time of communion of the hope that we have. That, that when all is lost, when everything seems like it's crumbling down around us, that it is well. Because God sent his son to die on the cross for you and for me to pay that price and to give us not just salvation, but to give us a hope and a future with him. So as you take these next few moments um, to meditate, I just want to remind you that, that no matter what is weighing on you this morning, that, that there is hope and that we can sing that song with full confidence that it is well because of Jesus. So I'm going to give you a, a few moments to, to meditate on that. Take the bread and the juice whenever you're ready and I'll be back in just a moment to pray. eternal life, but that we could have hope because you are good and you love us. And God, we rest in that truth this morning. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You can place your empty cups on the floor in front of you and then dispose of those as you leave here this morning. And then if you would, uh, take a minute to check out this cool video. Hey, Mitch, because of your uh, confession of faith and uh, your love for Jesus, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Your uh, confession of faith and your desire to follow Jesus, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we're because of your confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Last week, Pastor Jeff got to baptize Mitch, Trenton, and Cameron, and we just wanted to celebrate that this morning. Um, it's just been incredible what God has been doing over these past few weeks with the over 20 baptisms that we've been able to celebrate, and uh, that is in large part because of your generosity um, and your faithful giving each week that we are able to continue to see lives changed for eternity. And I'm so thankful to be a part of a church that is doing just that here in the Cape. I just want to say, if you are a guest with us this morning, please don't feel any pressure or obligation to give. We're just so thankful that you chose to worship with us this morning. Um, there are three ways that you can give on the screen. And then if you're worshiping with us in person, there are also offering boxes that you can use as you leave here this morning.
Well, uh, Crosspoint, we're uh, using those bumpers uh, all uh, month uh, just to say thank you to all of the people who serve around here and make such a great environment every single weekend, especially today. I just want to say thank you to those who serve in Kid Point with all of our children. Thank you for the difference you're making in their lives and in their parents' lives. And for all of our guest services team, thank you for the great job that you do of welcoming people to our campus. Well, I want to uh, go off script here just for a second and uh, as we worshiped, I just felt compelled to take a minute and do this. So I, I want to quickly share a story with you that happened yesterday, and then I want to take a minute to uh, pray. Um, so uh, some of uh, the guys that uh, play basketball at Mariner were playing in a tournament yesterday, and uh, our own Derek Purdy was part of that team. And uh, he came out of the game, uh, was fine, and suddenly those suffered a seizure and uh, was a very, very traumatic situation. He was rushed to the hospital. I can say today he is uh, doing much better, and the prognosis looks good. Uh, long-term heart issue that he's probably going to have to deal with. But it was a very traumatic moment uh, in that gymnasium yesterday afternoon. I know very traumatic for coaches and players. Many of them are here today. And so I just, uh, and their families. And so I just want to take a minute and pray for uh, Derek. I want to pray for these guys that are here today because uh, I know that it has deeply impacted them as they watched all of that unfold yesterday. And some of our other students that are connected with them has impacted them as well. And so we'll, we'll just take a minute. I want to pray for Derek and for the team. God, I, um, I lift up Derek right now. And um, God, I just I thank you that you saw him through that. As traumatic and scary as it was, God, the fact that he he's okay today and that uh, they figured out what is wrong. I pray for his ongoing care and for the healing process that needs to take place in his body and that, God, you'll just continue that healing process and protect him uh, from any other episodes and, God, that you just bring healing to him. I pray for, for his mom, Kim, and their family, that, God, you would just uh, give them strength and peace and as they navigate through this. And, God, I pray for, uh, for the guys that are here today and for the rest of their team who stood and watched that yesterday. I pray, God, that you would heal them and you'd give them confidence in you. I pray the same for, for Coach and for all of the families that are connected with that and for others in our church that are deeply connected in that. I pray for strength and healing and peace for all of them, God. Uh, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. So, uh, back on script. In uh, September of 1967, uh, fighter pilot John McCain was flying his plane over North Vietnam when he was shot down. At 500 miles an hour, his plane went spiraling toward the ground. He ejected from the plane, and the process broke his left arm, his right arm in three places, and his left knee. He landed in a shallow lake where he was eventually pulled out by some, a mob of people who began to beat him up. Eventually, the army came along and grabbed him and took him off to a prisoner of war camp where he suffered there for several years, along with 80 other prisoners of war that had been captured. Those prisoners of war reported that during that time, it was a terrible experience. They were often kept in solitary confinement. They dealt with sickness and torture. They were not treated well. But they began to develop between them a system of communication because they knew they needed each other to be able to survive this. And so they developed a set of hand signals. They took paper cups and sometimes were able to talk back and forth between the walls of their confinement. They tapped on the walls in code. They would sometimes find small pieces of toilet paper and leave notes for each other. Over this process, they began to know each other's names, and so they began a habit that would sustain them. Each night as they laid their head on their pillow to try to fall asleep, they would recite the names of all of the other prisoners that they had come to know in that camp. And what they would later share is that that, that saying those names is what helped sustain them. It gave them the will to keep on living because they knew one another and they were known by each other. They needed relationship to be able to sustain what they were experiencing. And their experience reminds us of a fundamental truth about every human being. We need each other. God has hardwired us up to be in relationships. We were not created to live in isolation. God himself lives in community as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He ordained that people would be connected in community with each other through the local church. And as we talked about last week, 100 times in the New Testament, he speaks through the writers of the New Testament to give us some instructions about how to treat one another so that our relationships can be healthy and strong if we'll follow these one another instructions. 
and these instructions help us at the same time to become more like Jesus. So in this series, Faces, we're talking about five of these one another instructions. We began in week one with F, forgive one another. Whether you feel like it or not, it is something that is demanded of us for our own good and because Jesus calls us to do it. The A stands for accept one another. And last week we talked about we must guard against our opinions and differences over things that are not a matter of Scripture. We must keep those things from causing division among us. Today I want to talk about the C, which is caring for one another. And I'm using the word care here to represent really two different instructions that we are given by Paul in a letter that he writes called Galatians. These two instructions are different but very similar. In Galatians 6, 2, he gives us this one another instructions. He says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. It's this idea of carrying each other's burdens in life. Earlier then, in chapter 5, he says, serve one another humbly in love. Now, what's going on here that Paul writes these two instructions so close to each other in this letter? Well, in this letter that he writes to the church in the region of Galatia, he's been writing a lot about our freedom. The idea that these, these believers in Galatia, they no longer had to use the Old Testament law as the measuring stick for their lives. They, they were no longer living under all of the rules and regulations that you find in the Old Testament. They no longer were being judged by God based on how well they kept all of the commandments or how well they offered their sacrifice. Paul reminds them at us, that when Jesus died on the cross, he paid the price for our sins once and for all. And now because of that, if he's our Savior, we live in the freedom of that forgiveness. I don't know if you've ever been given a freedom or a privilege that maybe had some boundaries to it, but there was a great freedom, but you sort of pushed the boundaries a bit. When I was in high school, I was given the freedom to drive to school. I had a car. It was a shared car. That was always clear to me. But I, I got to drive to school. That was a wonderful freedom, right? I no longer had to depend on somebody else. I didn't have to ride the bus. I got to drive to school. But there were some boundaries to that. I wasn't allowed to have anyone else in the car with me. That was probably wise. I didn't understand it at the time, but it probably made sense. But I decided somewhere along the way that I would extend that freedom, that I'd push the boundaries of that freedom I decided I would pick this girl up who lived on my way to school and give her a ride to school. Now, I did that for several days, pushing the boundaries until my mom was cleaning out the car one day and she found the back of an earring on the passenger side. First, I acted like I didn't know anything about it, of course, right? Always deny to begin with. But she figured it out. I had pushed the boundary of a freedom that I had been given, which, by the way, let me just be really clear because my wife is in this service. Nothing happened. <laughs> it was just a ride to school several days. That was absolutely the end of it. But I had pushed the boundary of a freedom that I had been given. Listen to what Paul says next in Galatians chapter 5. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. You've been given this freedom because of Jesus dying on the cross, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Don't push the boundaries of the freedom that I've been given. You've been given. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. He goes on and says this, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Which, by the way, he's just quoting Jesus here. Remember, Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, well, it's really two things. It's to love God and to love people. So Paul quotes that, and then he says this, if you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So here, here's what's happening. Paul says, you've been given this, this freedom through Jesus, but you're pushing the boundaries of the freedom by indulging your own desires. Your sinful desires are pushing you to abuse the freedom that you've been given. You're not just enjoying the freedom of driving to school. You're picking up the girl on the way. And then he goes on to give us a whole list of abuses, things that they were doing that pushed the boundaries of the freedom that they had been given. And what we're going to see in a minute as we look at this list is that it has to do so much with our relationships. 
that so often we push the boundaries of the freedom that we have been given, and what it ends up damaging is our relationship with each other, how we treat one another. Isn't it interesting that in that verse, in verse 13, Paul says that the way, one of the ways to keep from indulging our sinful nature, to keep from pushing the boundary of freedom, is to serve one another. Now, why is that? See, here's the thing. If the focus is on me, what's pleasurable for me, what's comfortable for me, what I want, then the likelihood is I'm going to indulge my sinful desires because those are the things that make me feel good, at least temporarily. But if I change the focus of my life to be on serving other people, it takes the focus off of me and I am less likely to indulge my sinful nature. I am less likely to push the boundary of the freedom that I have been given. Listen, I could claim that the reason I wanted to give that girl a ride to school is because I wanted to serve her. We all know that's not true. I did it for me. I wanted to impress her. I wanted her to like me. I wanted, it was about me. It was indulging something that for myself. And friends, so often we do damage in our relationships because we push the boundaries of freedom to indulge ourselves. It's something for me. I think we all want to be known as someone who loves and serves other people. I mean, I don't know that I've ever met anyone who would say, yeah, I want everyone to think that I'm selfish and not caring. And that's not what we want. And yet that's what we do sometimes because we indulge our sinful desires. Notice what Paul says next, verse 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit, right? Something different. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They don't want the same things. Then he goes on to say this. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Right? And so there's these two opposing things that are in conflict and Paul says, instead of just indulging your sinful desires and letting it push you beyond the boundaries of the freedom that you've been given, instead, why don't you listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit? And then he gives us these two lists that are a tremendous contrast of each other. He says this in verse 19, the acts of the flesh are obvious. The things, my sinful desires, the things that they push me to do, look at the list he gives us. And notice, I've put a little star here by all of the things that involve relationships, right? These things that I put the star by, they all get lived out in relationship with other people. Sexual immorality, right? In, in a relationship. Impurity and debauchery often get lived out in relationship. Idolatry and witchcraft, not as much. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions and factions, envy, drunkenness, that can happen outside of a relationship, but it's often in a relationship environment that that gets lived out. Orgies and wild parties. Right? And some of you are thinking, I didn't know those kinds of words were in the Bible, but they are. And all of those are about relational kinds of things that happen in our lives, and all of them are driven by our own sinful desires that push us to step outside of the freedom that we've been given to abuse that freedom, and in almost every case, they end up damaging the relationships that we even say that we value. They push us to treat each other in ways that are not healthy. Then Paul, though, gives us a different list. In verse 22, he says, but the fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that lives within us, the fruit of the Spirit is, look at this list, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, all of which are lived out and impact the relationships that we have with other people. And then Paul says this in the next verse, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. What does he mean? Well, when I decided to follow Jesus, part of deciding to follow Jesus was repenting or changing the direction of my life. And instead of moving in the direction of my sinful desires and what I want for myself, I changed the direction of my life and I started following after what Jesus wants for me. I started trying to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. 
And then he says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And so here he paints us this picture. If we're going to consistently care for one another, then we have to decide to be Spirit-led instead of flesh-driven. Or maybe you would think of it this way. If we're going to consistently care for other people, we got to decide which voice we're going to listen to. Am I going to listen to the voice of my sinful desires that causes me to step outside of the freedom beyond the boundaries and end up doing damage to my relationships? Or will I listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit who helps me to have healthy relationships? Maybe you think of it like this. What voice are you going to listen to? If you're struggling with your marriage, which voice are you going to listen to? You're going to go to the, the three or four time divorced friend who has a messed up relationship right now and ask for their advice? Or are you going to go for some marriage advice to the couple that you know that has a really strong marriage that they work really hard at, they communicate well, their relationship is growing to be like what God wants it to be? Which, which voice are you going to listen to? Or if you're struggling as a parent, are you going to go to the parents that their children are always disrespectful and talk back and never obedient? Or are you going to go to the parents who are doing the best they can to raise children that love God and practice obedience? Which voice are you going to listen to? Or if you're struggling financially, are you going to go to the, the friend that's over their head in debt and just spends money frivolously? Or, or are you going to go to the friend that, that knows how to manage their money? Which voice are you going to listen to? And when it comes to relationships with each other, which voice are you going to listen to? The voice of, the, of your own sinful desires, the flesh, which lead to that first list? I mean, is this really what you want for the relationships that you have? Or are you going to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit who leads us to have this list, which I think is the kind of relationships and the kind of heart that we want to have so that we can have healthy relationships? If your relationships are struggling, maybe you're listening to the wrong voice. And if you want healthy relationships, then maybe you need to start listening more to the voice of the Holy Spirit so he can grow this healthy list in us. Listen, really, friends, everything that we're talking about in this series, whether it is forgiveness or acceptance or caring for one another or next week, encouragement, all of them are built on this foundation of which voice are you listening to? your own sinful desires that lead to the wrong list or the Holy Spirit who leads us to the right list. Well, let's try to talk practically then for just a moment or two about this idea of caring for one another and what that actually looks like in our lives. And Paul really gives us two things that we've talked about. He says caring for one another first means serving one another. And when it comes to serving one another, there's not a better example that I know of than what Jesus did while he was here on earth. On the night that he was celebrating the Passover meal with his disciples, they gathered in a room, and as they were having this meal, Jesus takes a towel and wraps it around his waist, and he gets up, and he begins to wash the feet of his disciples. Now, it was the normal practice that when you came to someone's home as their guest, they typically would have a servant or someone from their household that as you entered, they would wash your feet, because in those days, the, the roads were a dirt path, and they wore these open sandals, and so your feet would be covered in dirt and sometimes mud, and so someone would wash your feet as you came into the house, but on this particular night, no one has washed anyone else's feet. And so Jesus takes it upon himself to get up from their dinner table and to take that towel and a basin of water and begin to go around the room and wash his disciples' feet. And as he finishes washing their feet, Jesus says this to them and really to us too. He says, I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. And I don't think there that Jesus meant just that I have given you an example of washing each other's feet. I think what Jesus will said, I have given you an example of what it looks like to serve one another, and I'm inviting you to do the same. In fact, you can't follow Jesus and not be willing to serve one another. So, I think there are some things that Jesus models for us that have to be true for us if we're going to really serve one another. First, serving requires humility. Listen, if Jesus... <laughs> who in that moment still was the king of the universe, can get up and wash a bunch of dirty feet. There is nothing that, is, that none of us then are too important or too good to serve other people. There's nothing that's below us. When I, when I think about this principle, I think about uh, my friend Carl Schwing. We did a celebration of life service for him yesterday. Um, 
He was in a tragic car accident and passed away recently. Carl, at one time, in the beginning days of Cross Point's existence, was a part of our church, and at the same time, he worked uh, for the city of Cape Coral in their development department, and then later as the assistant city manager for a period of time as the interim city manager, and then moved on and became the city manager in Bonita Springs. But when we first started Cross Point, and we were doing portable church every Sunday at Mariner, setting up and tearing down, Carl would show up at 7 o'clock on Sunday mornings, like several of others. He would help us get these big black cases out of trailers and trucks and wheel them down hallways and into classrooms. And for a period of time, he would assist Matthew, Matt, uh, in setting up the elementary Kid Point area. In fact, the, Matt tells the story yesterday, the first time that Carl, who Monday through Friday set in important meetings and made big decisions for our city, the first time Carl showed up, he walked in when Matt was a seventh grader and said to Matt, Matt, you tell me what to do. And Matt would tell him, hey, do this. Now, listen, first of all, you should never take instructions from a seventh grade boy. <laughs> I don't think. But Matt would tell him what to do. And I just think about that, and as Matt told that story yet, I thought that is, that is such a tremendous example of humility. Here's a guy, a leader in our city, who is willing just to show up and let a seventh grader tell him what to do and just serve. And friends, you're not above emptying the dishwasher or doing the laundry or cleaning out the car at home. And you're not above pulling your neighbor's trash can back up to the house for them. And you're not above holding open a door or holding children in kid points. You're not too important or too good to serve one another. Not in God's perspective of things. I think also this teaches us that serving may require you to do something that seems uncomfortable. I doubt very much that Jesus relished the thought of going around the room and washing a bunch of dirty feet. I mean, if that sounds appealing to you, I think you have a problem, personally. But he wasn't looking for what was convenient. And you and I, sometimes we will have to step out of our comfort zone to serve other people. We may have to do things that we think we're not very good at or doesn't seem convenient in the moment, but serving requires that I'm willing to do Sometimes what's not comfortable. Serving is also not always convenient. Right? Sometimes when I serve others, it means juggling my schedule or changing my plans. Sometimes serving others means that I've got to be willing to give a, sen- a, a certain amount of time or energy or effort, even, even when it's not convenient. But here's the last thing I know. Serving produces joy. You know, in the moment, it may cost us something. It may not seem like a bunch of fun right when we're doing it, but when we are finished, when we have served other people, there is a sense of joy that fills our hearts. I've been watching it happen around here these last uh, few days, and as we're anticipating our, uh, our uh, drive through costumes and candy festival, I've almost got the name down. Uh, when it's over, maybe I'll have learned it. And uh, when I were anticipating that Friday night, really super excited about it, and I've been watching some of you who are doing little things to help get prepared for it, putting things together, creating things, building things. And as I've watched you doing those things and heard you talking about it, I can just see there is this sense of joy that fills you as you get that, get that part of it done. And I said to our staff this week, I'm excited about this event because I love these kinds of big events that we get to do together as a church family because it produces a sense of joy in all of us when we get to serve other people. Well, here's the second thing that I think Paul would say about caring for one another. It also means carrying one another's burdens. Carrying one another's burdens. Remember what we read in Galatians 6 two? Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What's he talking about when he says fulfill the law of Christ? He's talking about that same thing where Jesus said there's two commandments, to love God and love people. And when we carry each other's burdens... It's an example of loving other people. Listen, no one was created to carry all of the burdens that we experience in life by themselves. When a loved one dies, people are not intended to try to carry that burden all by themselves. They need someone to help them carry it. And when they have important life decisions to make, big questions, they need someone to help them carry that burden. When they're struggling as a parent or a spouse, they often need someone to help them carry that burden. 
When someone has questions about God or they, their faith, they need someone to help them carry that burden. When they're struggling with sin in their lives, they need someone to help them carry that burden. And listen, you know what? They're not always looking for us to have the perfect answer or to fix it for them or to have just the right thing to say. More often than not, they don't need us to say anything. They just need us to be there so that they know they're not carrying that burden all by themselves. They just need to know somebody is willing to walk that journey with them. So I want you, I want you to think. Think about your life and your sphere of influence. Who in your life right now is carrying a heavy burden? And what could you do this week to reach out to them and help them to carry that burden so they know they're not carrying it all alone, that all the weight's not just on their shoulders? Mark Buchanan uh, tells a story of, uh, he's, a, he's a pastor, and I read his story this week. He talks about two times where he saw community lived out in his church. He said the first one was a simple thing. He said there were a bunch of guys, we were all friends with each other, and one of them was moving from one house to another, and so we all said, hey, we'll show up, and the guy that was moving had, a, a, had bought a bunch of wings, and so they ate together and laughed, and then they said, okay, let's get, on with, let's get on with the moving, and one of them, as they got ready to start packing stuff up or putting it on the truck, said, you know what, this is community, and Mark thought, you know, as crazy as that seems, it really is, right? Because we've laughed together, we hang out together, we're doing life together, we care about each other, and we help each other even with the simplest of things, like moving from one house to another. He said, but then I began to think about another event that had happened that was also community. He said there had been a time where a woman named Wanda had showed up at their church asking for some help, some guidance. But Wanda struggled with addictions, and she was happy to be given anything that would give her any kind of high or buzz. And oftentimes she had no money to pay for it, and so the only way she had figured out a way to still acquire that stuff and was willing to do that. So Wanda began to tell her story, and as she told her story, they listened, and then they began to tell her about Jesus and how much he cared about her and how much he loved her and how he had died for all of her sins. And she became very curious about maybe she wanted to follow Jesus. And so they said, well, why don't you come to church on Sunday? And they said, I, I don't know how comfortable you feel about coming to church. And so if you want to show up a little late and, and just sit in the back and kind of watch what's going on, that's fine. You just do whatever you're comfortable. And she said, well, why would I do that? I've been waiting to hear this my whole life. And so the next Sunday she did show up. She was the very first one there. She sat right down in the front. She loudly agreed with everything that Mark said as he spoke that morning. She was the last one to leave. The next week she showed up again and she brought a friend with her who struggled with the same things. And they sat right down there and listened as Mark talked about what it meant to, to serve one another and how that if we're following Jesus and we want to follow Jesus, we need to be willing to serve other people. And so he wrapped up his message, and on this particular day, the way they were doing communion, he said to them, hey, I, I'm going to invite those who are going to serve communion to come forward. But all Wanda heard was there was a chance to serve. And so she immediately just jumped up and joined those other people right down in front, and Mark thought, oh, oh this is not what I was expecting. But she thought, I want to serve other people. And so Mark thought, well, I'm not going to embarrass her. And so he went down and he said to Wanda, hey, I know you've never done this before, so how about we do it together today? And so together they began to pass communion out. This was pre-COVID when you could still touch things. And um, they began to pass communion. And he wasn't sure how people would respond, but he said as we passed that communion down that whole section, everyone who saw Wanda looked at her with love and acceptance. And he thought to himself, that's, that's community. See, I think both of those things are true. And I'm so grateful because I believe we have both of those kinds of community here. But I don't ever want us to take them for granted. We need to value them. We need to protect them. We need to make sure that we don't do anything that pulls us away from that sense of community and puts us in isolation. And we need to live out these principles that we're talking about in this series so that those relationships and that community can be as strong as God intends it to be and as healthy as he wants it to be as we try to care for one another. Let's pray together. God, thank you for the sense of community that you have given us. God, help us to protect that. Help us to value that. Help us to protect it. And God, would you help it to grow in each of us? God, right now, would you help us to think about people in our own lives maybe that are carrying a heavy burden? God, would you help us to know how maybe this week we could help carry that burden for them? Lift it from us, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Well, we want to uh, celebrate a baptism right now, and so if you want to direct your attention towards the baptism pool, that'd be great. Hey guys, this is Parker, and Parker, if you believe these words in your heart, I'd invite you to repeat them after me. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, my Lord and Savior. Awesome. really awesome. So excited that we can celebrate yet another baptism. Well, hey, we are just five days away from our drive through costumes and candy event this weekend, and we are just so excited that we have this opportunity to love our community in this way. And I just want to ask that as we're leading up to this event, that you would be praying each and every day for each and every person that's going to be on our campus, that they would just know and feel and see the love of Jesus as they come to this event this weekend. Well, if you would like to talk to anybody about your relationship with Jesus or would like somebody to pray with you, our prayer team will be down in front here after the service. And if you're online and would like to pray with somebody, you can just click that prayer request button and somebody would love to pray with you. Uh, Hope you guys have a great week. Excited to see you back here next week. And as you go out, remember to love God, love people, and share Jesus. We'll see you later.